very diverse group of people from all over uh, the country and possibly even Canada, if I, if I remember correctly. You'll notice that a recording popped up. We are recording this just in case we want to use it for the future. Um, and uh, some people that maybe couldn't attend today, maybe they still want to view um, the conversation later. So if you click accept, that would be great. My name is Evan Rudder, the Assistant Vice President for Alumni and Parent Engagement at CMC, also an alumnus. Uh, and it's my pleasure to be here uh, on July 2nd um, with uh, Nere Gray, Associate Vice President um, for Diversity and Inclusion, our Chief Civil Rights Officer uh, at the college. First off, Happy New Year. Um, our, our calendar year, our fiscal year at the college goes from July 1 until June 30. Uh, so we are kicking off um, a lot of new things here at the college, but uh, first a big thank you to all of you who supported the college financially uh, and with volunteerism uh, and with your thoughts over the last 365 days. Uh, we can't do it without the support of our alumni and parents, all that we do from student scholarships to emergency funding, crisis response. Um, so much of what we do is because of your engagement and your philanthropy, so thank you. A few things about Zoom. I mentioned the chat feature. You click on that and open, thing, open up a chat to the right. Not only is everyone putting their name and class year, city and state or parent year, uh, but they're also, uh, that's where you could submit questions if you want me to ask your questions during the Q&A portion. So feel free uh, to put a question in there and I'll ask it um, when, the, when the time's appropriate. If you click on the participant section, you'll notice on the right, um, the uh, list of attendees will, uh, will pop up. Uh, there's also a button there that says raise hand. If you want to uh, ask a question directly to uh, Nerey um, when we get to the Q&A portion. Just click that and I'll call on you in the appropriate order uh, as well. And then the top right, you'll notice speaker view um, and grid view. So depending on how you prefer your Zoom, uh, you can select what you prefer. If, this, if you're on speaker view right now, then you pretty much just see me right now with a few boxes of people at the top. And if you like grid view, which I like because I can see more people, um, go ahead and click grid view and then you should see anywhere between 25 and 48 uh, different boxes in front of you. So it is, of course, up to you. Uh, we're going to have a presentation from uh, Nere Gray uh, for a half hour and then we're going to questions and answers. Um, it is uh, my pleasure to turn it over to Nere Gray. Nere has been with us since October 2014, so almost a six year anniversary. Uh, with CMC. Uh, prior to the college, she was the uh, law professor and dean of students and diversity affairs at Southwestern Law School in downtown Los Angeles. Uh, at CMC, I mentioned she is our chief civil rights officer. Uh, she works on and oversees civil rights policy for the college and works with students, staff, and faculty in relation to diversity and inclusion at the college. Nere, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Evan. Um, good morning for those who it's still morning. Good day for those who it's not morning still. I'm so glad that you joined us. To my colleagues who are on this call, I'm honored because it's a vacation day. So that's nice of you to still spend time with me. Thank you so much. Um, everybody in this community, I feel at one point is experiencing the same energy that I'm feeling at this moment, which is it's a bit of um, this is a lot, right? Like it's a bit of this summer 2020 will be a remarkable one for many reasons and i think part of it comes from we were already managing covid and and when i say managing it was various levels day to day and then with the summer being i always think the summers before an election year are especially exciting because things start to build um i like that i'm at this date as the fourth of july is coming this weekend which i hope everyone enjoys even if indoors and I also think about where we are as a society in relation to race at this moment, just this moment. And when I think of this moment, I think of their defining moments in history, and I think I'm experiencing one. And for those, and I've done civil rights work for, for many years, even as a lawyer before I became a law professor, um, for those of us who have been around this block for a while, not just engaged in civil rights, but seeing the changes as we talk about race in America, um, then this moment takes on a different meaning. And so I'll share with you a little, not just for the context of where we are in terms of local news, or not just in the context of, you know, the lives that have been lost, but the context of, I come at this from the experience of seeing things happen in what I call a, a cycle. So for me, and, and I can say back in, 92 when I was still in California and we were only talking about one incident, 
um, although others had happened, but that's where our focus was. There was a belief of like everyone circles around a moment and then that moment passes and we go back to our daily lives. I think we've seen this issue with schools and guns as well. There's a moment, everyone turns their attention in that moment, it occupies our news, it occupies our days, and then eventually the news cycle will shift to something else. And so for those who have kind of been watching this trend, it is an interesting moment for that purpose because for me in this space, um, not just a woman who's experienced it as, as a black woman of mid forties, but as someone who's looking at it like, wait a minute, the news didn't shift as fast this time. We didn't move on as quickly as we usually do. And what does it mean that we didn't move on as quickly? And so when I think of this moment in history, I think of it not just because of the loss. And, and I think all people who have watched uh, the news have been impacted in one way or another about, uh, by the death of George Floyd. But I, I think overall, I've been more impacted by the demonstrations as a result of the loss. And I can say for the first time that I've seen, it's been a different place for this type of protest. It's been a different body that's been out there in the streets actually saying, I'm standing up for um, equality. And, and I mean that from the sense of, I've seen all ages, all generations, I've seen all cultures, all backgrounds, all in this one spot of trying to send a message of equality. And I think of it in that way because over time, if I look back even at the 60s, of course there were people of all cultures who were involved in the civil rights movement. Um, but I don't think I've ever seen it to the degree that I see it now. And I, I attribute that to a few different things. So I, I frame my words in this space. I always think that in order for something to be impactful, it needs attention and it needs a spark at the right moment. And as I've studied movements over time, it's always a trigger moment and it's always the world has attention on it at that time. So if I think of Rosa Parks and, and refusing to give up her seat, there's a, there's a spark at a moment that everyone's turned to. If I think of even Selma, um, there's a visual of where now it's on the news and you're seeing how other Americans are being treated that causes people to be inspired in that moment. So I, I look at the visualization of this incident as one of those moments where people can't really turn away. Um, people are in a space where they have to watch and then it leads to a different reaction. I also am in an interesting space in time where if you look at our workforce right now, this is the first time that we actually have between four and five generations of people in the workplace at the exact same time. In our country for a while, we've been on this interesting cycle that people usually hit a certain age, then they retire, then we have a new workforce coming in. But I'd say for the past decade, people have been staying at work longer. And with that in mind, we're getting a varied age range in the workplace at the same time. And so managing those issues often impact how we view race in a society as well. So I look at the combination of all these factors that I think contribute to this moment in history at this time. The range of age that we have in the workplace, the time that more people are actually home than usual, the fact that more people are engaged in the news because they really don't have much else to do, they're not doing much outside, impacts how people are experiencing this moment. And I also think generationally, we've lived through a group of people who have had eight years of a presidency of a person of color, right? So the, the visual image of what black people are has shifted in media, even from that experience, whether you support him or not, the visual is still there. And I think that shifts of an actual existence. So as I look at higher ed and liberal arts colleges and what students are demanding from a college at this time, I do see a shift of people wanting to engage and learn more about people who have different backgrounds from their own. I see more of a yearning of people of all backgrounds wanting to be able to bring their identity into the space where they are. And that goes for white people as well. I see this as more of people are saying, I wanna be accepted in the space that I exist. And that means the workplace, that means in the classroom, that means outside of my home period, I wanna feel that I can be exactly who I am in these spaces. 
and that the community will allow a space for me to be that. And so all of this impacts, I think, this moment. Over, as you can imagine, over the past few weeks, I've had a ton of people reach out. Reach out with, hey, how's it going? How you doing? I'm sure you're busy. Reach out with, hey, is your family healthy? I hope everyone's okay. But also reach out with like, how are you managing this moment? And I can tell you as, as a mother of two sons, it's a scary moment. It really is. It's a moment in which I, I think about it. I think about my own husband. I think about my nephew. I think about all the people in, in my own family that I care deeply for. Um, and I also think about everybody who's been so connected. And, and I'll give you an example, just, just so you can share the shift in the room. Um, I live in Claremont. And overall, I will say Claremont is a, a lovely place. It's a lovely place to raise a family. Um, it's a lovely place that's full of people who are usually been here for a while. Like we're rather newcomers. We've only been here a few years. I, I really only moved in this area after I took the job. But there's a lot of people in Claremont who have been here for decades, just decades. It's a community of, of people who really anchor in this space. And so usually in the mornings as I go for my walk, sometimes people say hello. I must admit, usually people with dogs are a little friendlier. I don't have one, so I'm not making judgments. Um, but usually they'll say hello. They'll say good morning. Um, but oftentimes, no. I would say for the past, you know, when I started walking in like April, um, it changed. In March when I was walking, it was one thing. People would sometimes avert a gaze or just not make the eye contact. Um, I will say, though, it, it's been a change since this incident, since the demonstrations and the protests start. There's a lot more good mornings. There's a lot more eye contact. There's a lot more, um, even those who are older and not Black, who are making an effort to say hello, uh, sometimes in ways they catch me off guard. Like when they walk by and say, like, Black Lives Matter. I don't know whether to say, like, thank you. I, I'm really not sure of the response to that. Um, but I'm like, I appreciate the effort. So when I think about what people are feeling in this moment, I respect the fact that people feel the need to engage in some way, maybe not sure quite how to do it, but feel that this is a moment that they're compelled to do something. And I, and I wanna support that as best I can. And so for me, I think of this as how do we communicate in ways that support people's true intentions? And I look at, some people have discussed race for a very long time just because they haven't had the option not to, right? It's, it's such a defining moment of their experience. There's not really much of my um, life that I can say that race hasn't impacted in some way. Other people are very new to the conversation, have been able to just be in communities where it's not part of their existence or not as impactful on a daily basis. And they're coming to this conversation of race, race in America, um, what does it mean to be inclusive? What does it mean to understand that, yes, by being of a certain race, it comes with certain privileges, not always tied to economics, not always tied to being financially superior, um, but often just by the presence and an identity that you occupy, it comes with some privileges. But understanding all of this in such a new way and really wanting to be part of a conversation to better educate themselves. Oftentimes people are asking me really important questions like, what should I be doing? And by no means do I think, um, although I consider myself well-versed in, in race, in historical context of race, in diversity and inclusion and civil rights, I, I am not instructive in the sense of you must do these five things in order to be you know, a better racially qualified person. I really am of a space of, I'd like for people to think about reflecting internally. I am not one in which to say, if you read this book, it's better than reading this other book. I actually think um, if you're studying Black experiences, they're not monolithic. I don't think it's one particular experience that defines our entire race or existence. Therefore, I don't think my own opinion reflects the voice of every Black person. It reflects my own experience. But I do think that if people are trying to learn or engage, it starts with a moment of self-reflection. And not self-reflection on what I consider the easy question. I don't want people to ask themselves like, am I racist? I, I, I think that starts with an, an awkward premise that, that I don't think really gets to the narrative that you wanna get to. Um, I would hope for most people when they ask themselves that question, they'd be like, no, of course not. 
But I want people to think a little further and to talk to yourself about, do I have a diverse group of friends? Do I have a diverse group of friends? If tomorrow you had to invite five black people to dinner, could you do that? Could you find them? Would they answer your call? Could you actually list them, right? And not people like way back in the day in high school, I knew one, but like some that you've actually talked to in a while. And you can pick any race. It doesn't have to be black, any Japanese, Latin, pick one, doesn't matter. But do you have someone with a different life experience than your own on a racial basis that you say, yeah, absolutely, I could. Do you think about in ways of, have you ever adjusted your behavior because of the race or gender of another person? And when I talk about adjusting behavior, I mean really minute things you may think in your head that you think I did it, but I didn't really think about it. Did I wait for an elevator because someone else approached that I thought I may be uncomfortable with? Did I change direction on the sidewalk? Did I cross the street? Did I decide, eh, maybe I won't sit at this table. Maybe I'll be asked to sit at another table just so I can avoid a potentially loud crowd because I think by their identity, they'll be loud. Those are things that I want you to ask yourself. In ways have you adjusted due to perceptions you had about the race of another person or gender? And if that's so, then that's the area I want you to reflect on. I saw quickly as it glanced up that someone mentioned White Fragility as a book. I agree. I think a lot of people have been reading that and found it helpful. I want people to, um, sometimes people treat this in the way they do, like I treat diets, like I go hard on a diet on Monday, and then by Friday, I'm like, boy, am I tired, I'm not skinny yet, maybe I better eat something else, right? Sometimes people go all in, and then they get overwhelmed with the amount of information, and then they tend to back off. I don't want people to approach it. I want people to start viewing their own lifestyle choices, and then having conversations within their own families. So what's been pleasant for me is that for the people who have reached out, Many of them have shared, you know what, I wasn't really thinking about it that much, but I had my kids over for dinner. I had my kids over for dinner and they were asking like, hey, what are you doing? <laughs> like, what are you doing? What is going on? What are we going to do as a family that really pushes equality forward? And so as you start to talk with different generations, whether it's your own kids or your grandkids, um, you will see that they've had a different experience with race potentially than you have because education has started to incorporate issues of inclusion, issues of equity, is issues of systemic inequality into education, into part of the everyday conversation in ways that they were not there when I was in K through 12 education um, and were barely being talked about in college, quite frankly. And so by having those opportunities internally with your own family at the dinner table to discuss these issues, I think that's what moves behavior forward to be able to be self-critical as well as reflective, to think about your own interactions, both positive and negative, to think about experiences that you've had and were they in any way racialized by the fact that the person was of a different background than your own? Those are things that I want you to think about as you're reflecting, maybe even before you read. There's so many great um, books out there and, and I think part of it is a lot of them are focusing on getting you to a level of just basic language and discussion about racial issues. So um, for some, the language of them may be off-putting, right? Talking about a privilege or talking about how something superior or inferior may be off-putting. But I think the more that you learn about there's certain systems of inequality that have just transcended over time, they take on various forms, but they still transition over time, it's just a good way for you to start looking at the world in a different place and then transitioning to, and in light of this, does this inspire me to take actions? And when I think about the word that, that people are kind of struggling with now, it's, it's anti-racist. So first of all, I want people to really start to think about anti-racist in a way that they can get comfortable with those words. Generally, and, and for good reason, I, I think, any word that has racist in it should make people feel a little uncomfortable. So that's okay, like that's a good thing. But when you think about anti-racist as a narrative, it really is 
trying to say it's not enough not to just be in your own saying, I'm not racist, therefore I'm not contributing to the problem. The term anti-racist is asking people to actually work against racism, to actually work against those things that create inequalities in a structure, to actually take affirmative steps towards how you do this work. And so part of this is just people getting comfortable with that as a phrase of what it means to be anti-racist in the way that you run your daily life, in the way that you communicate with others, in the way that you present yourself and ideas, in the way that you give voice to other ideas. To be anti-racist is to say, I am committed to fighting racism and inequality. And if that's where you find yourself, then that term should be a reflective one for you. I used to, um, in many, many cases, still to this day, get asked to come in and do diversity training. Um, and, and I share this because that's the thing that I get asked for the most in terms of whether it's students, staff, or faculty. They're like, can't you train this person to be better? And I always tell them, like, if I were going to train them, I would have had to meet them when they were eight years old. They're like too late for me to retrain. I'm not going to deprogram. But what I can do is give people different tools. I just give people different tools in terms of how they're gonna approach a situation, how they're gonna rectify a problem, how they're going to engage with another person. I give people different tools. But a main core of trying to teach people about diversity or inclusion is the understanding of the visual that people get when they think about it. So for the most part, I want people to just visualize what an escalator does, whether it's going up or down. And if we're going up or down on the escalator, there's some people who are actually walking. They're like walking up the steps, walking down the steps. And then there's some people who are just standing on the side, letting the escalator run and saying, I'll get to this destination. So when people think about inclusion and racism and fighting racism, they want you actually not just to be walking up, they want you walking against the escalator. If it's going up, they want you going down. They actually want you affirmatively taking active steps to change the direction that this cycle is going. And so I want you to keep that because it's important that you know that it's not easy work to change a structural system that's been in for so many years. It's, it's become a natural part. And I'm not saying society in and of itself, but there's certain things that we've just grown accustomed to. It is what it is. And so to actually take an intellectual framework to tell your own self that you're going to look for ways to change your own structure in relation to other people is something that takes an intentional effort. It doesn't come by chance. It doesn't come by circumstance. It doesn't happen just because you're not engaging in things that cause harm to other people. It actually only comes as a result of you taking affirmative forward thinking action to make sure something doesn't happen. And I think that's the call that you're seeing now. The call to action that you're seeing now from people is to say, it's insufficient for me to say, I am not engaging in it, therefore that's enough. But it's actually calling upon people to go out and intentionally learn about it. And therefore, not only not further the harm, but help other people get into this conversation. People who usually would ignore it or have the decision not to engage in it, people are being asked to engage. So I think there's a variety of ways to do that. I personally will be the first to say, um, from, from being an undergraduate at Berkeley, I am done with demonstrations. I think I was kind of done then. There's, that's not really my thing. I think in all social movements, you need both. You need internal factors and external factors moving things forward. But I just always felt for me as a person, I was just not really good at demonstrations. Like I was not the person who was like yelling and holding a sign. But I was always the person who's like, who can tell us yes? Can I just talk to that person? Like, this is a lot of energy for me. But I see the benefit and value. I am deeply impressed by the inv individuals who have gone out. And I was impressed to see one in Claremont. Like, that was news to me, right? I, I think the volume of people who are out there making this public demonstration of a commitment to equality is beautiful. But I don't want people to feel that's the only thing that you can do. That's the only thing? I think every day we can do things. We don't need always to be there, although when it's time, please show up. But I think, are you doing things in your own job that would move this forward? Are you in the meetings with the decision makers and looking around to say, 
everybody kind of looks like us. There's nobody who doesn't. And if you're considering yourself excellent, what does that really mean? If we all are of the same and there's not a lot of variance, are there ways in which you see other voices not being centered or maybe talked over or maybe not being given the attribution for their ideas? And in any other setting, you may say something, but you choose not to. It's asking to say, acknowledge that and choose to acknowledge that ideas come from a variety of sources. And in so many ways, we'll start to see, in many ways, I think we already see the benefit of having a diverse group of people working to solve a problem. It just makes a better outcome. So with that in mind, and I, I hope people have lots of questions. I didn't wanna make this purely a lecture, um, but I did wanna engage and have conversation. In the time that we have together, I also, would love any questions you have. I'll, I'll do a brief summary and then I'll turn it over to Evan. Um, in the last communication from the president, the president indicated an, an initiative and it was an initiative in relation to anti-racism and it was also in relation to studying the black experience in America. And part of it was really trying to get to what we saw was an evolution in messaging. When the incident first happened, there was so many companies for the first time saying, Black Lives Matter, we, we are anti-racist, we're gonna look internally, we're gonna do these things. But, but it was more of an, a, like a, an affirmative statement of these are values we believe in, but without a lot of follow-up conduct of, this is what we're gonna do in light of this affirmative statement that we're making about equality. So part of this is thinking about what action steps are we gonna take to really move the ball forward? And so it, it touched in a few areas, whether it was community education, whether it was, you know, making every effort to recruit some more diverse faculty, students, staff, um, efforts in relation to thinking about the way we look at our policies in all departments and making sure that they're equitable. So you'll start to hear more information about that as we go through. It's really important to me just from a structural level. Moving forward, I'll be looking for a group of alumni to get involved. Um, we're already going to have a group of staff, a group of faculty, but, but people who want to get involved in this effort, really great if you would contact me and let me know of your interest. But even more important, even if you can't personally be involved, if you have ideas, if you have ideas that you've seen have worked in other places, if you've experienced things even in other countries that you think would be helpful here, um, we're looking for those too. So if you have communications that you'd like to share, you can always send them to change at cnc.edu, or you can always email me personally at ngray at cmc.edu. I'll make sure it gets in the chat. So if you didn't get it verbally, I'll make sure that I write down and make sure it gets in the chat. So you can contact at change at cmc or ngray at cmc.edu. And I'd love to hear from you. Ideas, perspectives, um, any suggestions that you have would be helpful for me. So at this point, I will turn it over to Evan and uh, Evan will share the questions that you have and I'll do my best to answer. Thanks, Duray, and of course, thanks for your time uh, as well. Um, we have a number of questions that have come in uh, in advance. We have some people with their hands raised as well. Um, there's, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of go out of order a little bit as, as they're, they're relevant, I think, in, in different ways. Um, the first question uh, that I'll ask you is about how CMC has maybe evolved over the last three decades. Someone mentioned that we, they don't think we've changed at all since Rodney King. And I would maybe like you to comment on how CM, CMC's diversity efforts over the last, certainly six years since you've been here. So, um, you know, such an interesting framework. Yeah, I, I think Rodney King was a, a marker for many people in terms of 92 and, and the impact that it had at that moment. So I can speak quite a bit to the last um, six years that I've been here, but I also want to honor all the efforts that came before I got here. So I will say when I came in 2014 as the college's first chief civil rights officer, um, I really knew what that meant, right? Like I, I understood what it meant to have that position at this college at that time. I also question the title. I'm like, civil rights, like what am I, the 60s, the 70s, a civil rights officer? You don't want an, an inclusion person? Like, what are you trying to say? Um, but I took that in too. I took that in as this, I thought, was a college who was trying to make clear direction in this area of equity, um, trying to understand how that was consistent with its values, 
trying to understand how this whole conversation about inclusion and diversity would fit in with what they believe their mission to be and struggling with the fact of um, for, for this community, it's one of the places and a part of what I value about being in this space is that it's not a traditional liberal arts college. It's not that everyone is thinking in one focus or direction. There really are a perspective of viewpoints that are represented at the college. And it's really important that all those viewpoints are valued. And so when I think about the change that's occurred, um, one, I think even being able to get out the president's message and initiative, I don't think I would have seen that in the 90s. I don't think I would have seen that in the early 2000s. I'm a little cautious to see if I would have seen it day one, but I do think we're there now. Um, having diversity and inclusion as, as an executive cabinet role at all, I think is also a change. Um, special attention to the curriculum in this area, offering more courses that address issues of inequality, race, gender, intersectionality. Um, could we use more for sure? But I think the fact that they're actually, you know, more here than probably were in the 90s for sure, I also see advances there. I would say big transitions in the Dean of Students Office, the way we approach bringing in students to Claremont McKenna College, what their orientation looks like to the college, and, and actually having conversations about what it means to be an inclusive campus is also part of what I would see as a transition. So I, I do see transitions. I'm sure people would feel they could move a lot faster. I'm not of the space to say we're where we need to be. Um, but I do see progress towards those goals. And, and I see this initiative as a furtherance of that progress. Hope that addressed the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, you mentioned coursework, and we had a question come in about general education requirements. Yeah. Um, what do you think about GE requirements uh, broadly, but also at CMC, whether it's race related or inclusion related? Cool. Um, I think this has come up every year since I've been here. And I, I want to let you in on the discussion, because of course in the consortium, um, I believe Pomona and Scripps have similar uh, general educa education requirements. So the conversation has come up from year to year. And from a process standpoint, I think it starts with curriculum committee and faculty, then full faculty discussion, then eventually elevates to the board to see if this is the direction. In the past, I'll give you, I'll give you the arguments on both sides. Um, I think there are people who say definitely this would make a meaningful experience for all students at least to be forced in some way to address these issues. We did a survey of the courses we actually offer and looked at courses that we believe address these issues and how many students just took them voluntarily, like without the requirement. And um, Peter Rubin would be one to, to verify my answer. But we had seen that it was close to like 75 to 80 percent of students had taken those courses, more than one, um, without having the requirement. So for some, they were like, we, we're doing it, maybe not in the same way. Others said symbolically, even if they're already doing it, the fact that the college views it as a requirement to, to build responsible leaders, it sends a significant signal. And so I anticipate that that conversation will come up again. Um, but to date, there's a mix between students who want it and students who already feel that they have too many requirements. Like, Quite frankly, there's a lot of students who feel, you know, the fact that I'm still trying to have to take PE at some point is still a requirement. So, so we're going to have to look at requirements overall. And I think in that discussion of requirements, um, this will definitely be part of that discussion. But it has come up and it continues to be a discussion at the college. But I, but I am, you know, optimistic by the increase in the number of courses that we've had in this area and by actually dedicating resources to more faculty developing courses in this area. Going next to Midori. Midori, if you want to unmute yourself and ask a question. Hi. Oh, yeah, cool. thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so you started just a little bit before I graduated. I'm class of 2015. Um, yeah. And um, I think that, you know, your last answer was a great segue into what I kind of wanted to get at to, which is really how do we ingrain anti-racism into a culture at a school, not just, um, you know, after reading the initiative, especially the curricular portion of it, um, actually, a compliment though to the school in that I thought this was one of the more robust um, initiatives that I've seen come out and I'm a teacher now so um, I've definitely been seeing a lot of um, educational entities putting out their own initiatives this is one of the more robust ones um, but you know just incentivizing faculty to recognize demonstrated leadership in developing anti-racism pedagogy for example um, I just personally am wondering 
Um, I'm glad you talked about required seminars. Um, I think there are may, may, maybe other ways like interdisciplinary studies as an actual department, um, talking about intersectionality. But reflecting on my own time at CMC um, and realizing that I, I came out of CMC with, with such a low, poor cultural competency and not until I became a teacher did I really understand um, how actually, unfortunately, little I got out of CMC in terms of really like rooted anti-racism work. Um, I'm wondering what we can do to change a culture, um, everyday interactions between students. Um, I think that's where I want to see the bridge between the initiative and when I'm having a conversation in Collins. Um, and I'm wondering how you envision that. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it's not, a, it's not a direct question, but um, I'm just wondering your thoughts about changing a culture. So I, I appreciate the question. I think it's at the heart of what the initiative strives to do, but even bigger than the initiative, I think it's at the heart of where colleges are supposed to be, right? There's a part of this that the reason why we've rooted it in this way is that I don't want anything about it to be a one-off program. Like, I don't want it to be a one-off after dinner or a one-off situation and that at the expiration of this year, we're done. We've checked that box. I really want it to be something that's ingrained in the framework of the college. And so we're looking for initiatives and ideas and implementation that do just that. Um, the other part is exactly what you're getting at. I don't think it's one course that's going to create the kind of conversations I'd want to see in Collins. I actually think it's going to have to be internalized not just by students, because um, they're only here for this bandwidth of four to five years, but really staff and faculty as an ethos of the college that will change that framework discussion. And so as part of this, that's why it was really important to include the voices of alums, to include trustees, to include staff. Many times when we do initiatives, they're only directed at students or only directed at faculty. But this one in particular, we're trying to embrace the whole college to move it forward in a certain direction, which is not to say it's going to be prescriptive of what perspective you need, but it really is more of like, we will integrate in our culture at CMC the ideas of what it means to be in a space that is committed to anti-racism, to be in a space that's committed to um, equality and the identity of students, not just for who they are racially, but that they bring a life experience with them when they come to this place. And that we have to honor the life experiences of not just our students, but staff and faculty. So I, I look forward to us and as we update the community, um, please continue to hold us accountable in that respect, because that is the shift we're trying to achieve, a full integration that therefore shifts the culture. Excellent question. All right, next up is Ben Turner. Ben, go ahead. Ben. Hi, Mary. Hey there. Um, Thank you so much for your talk and for all the work that you and the college are doing. It's really exciting to hear your thoughtfulness and like dedication to these issues. I know the school has already changed a lot since I was there already four years ago. Um, but my question sort of tied to the sort of black student experience at CMC. Um, just a cursory look right now at kind of the incoming class of CMC is about, I think, let me just double check to get the stats right. We're CMCers, we love numbers. Um, <laughs> There's about 4% um, enrollment of black students. And looking at the LA County numbers, looking at the United States numbers, LA County is something closer towards, I think, from the census, um, around 9% in LA County broadly, obviously not all of the Inland Empire and stuff like that. Um, the Pew Research Center listed 13% of the US population being black. And I think one of the things that I experienced a lot at CMC being from Canada and from a slightly different historical context was that I came in to CMC assuming that I would learn about America kind of broadly. And I think a lot of what I learned about America and Canada and a lot of the world is that there are these sort of historic and systemic treatments of different people, especially in the United States, obviously black people. And I think a lot of my black friends, my peers, my fellow students, they often as a smaller group on campus felt the brunt and the mantle of having to explain their experience to other students or to um, translate what I think a lot of the times I felt was the responsibility of professors or of administrators or of just educators in general to convey that. And so my question is, how do we empower people to do the learning that you alluded to through reading, through talking, through conversation um, that isn't just resting on my black friend or my black classmate and instead empowers people to 
um, challenge their own pre preconceived notions and really ask of their institution what the institution can do for them as opposed to what their peers and the people can maybe coming into it with more expected of them to do, if that makes sense. Oh, it makes perfect sense. And, and um, I, I want to be very clear of why that portion of it is part of the initiative, because many people, I won't say many, I actually think the response to the initiative has been overwhelmingly positive, and I appreciate that. There has been some that have speculated, like, why Black? Well, like, why not some other group? Um, and so your, your question brings to heart an issue that I think is particular to CMC. I think the enrollment of Black students at CMC is, is low and has been for a while. I think the 4% that you express as the entering class is probably reflective also of the 4% of alumni that are Black or African American as well. Um, that is one in which I think will come as we create a space that doesn't require that burden as people are in the community, right? If you're coming into a space knowing that you want a few, I will share with you, many of the black students who come here are used to that experience. They have been one of few for a very long time. Um, so, so it's not like they're misperceiving what CMC is, but they're thinking that as a college that we will be equipped to address issues of difference, inclusion, um, to bring that perspective into the classroom and into the res life in ways that are not reliant upon that individual. And so to your point, um, part of it is just a better education and giving people tools to do that. What happens is if you've never been expected or required to have to do that, it's easy to defer. I think what you're seeing more of is, is not only families <laughs> who are demanding that that's the case, but you're getting exactly the response you're sharing, Ben, which are people are starting to feel, I am missing out on something by not having that in the classroom demonstrated to me so that as I leave this place, I'm not in a space who's waiting for black people or some other race or an international student to correct a situation. And so part of it has just been in flat out giving faculty, staff, more tools in which to equip themselves to do that. Definitely it starts with reading, but it's also raising the level of expectation from that being a skill set that's just valued to that being a competency that's required of every member of our community. And that's the shift that's going to get where you need to and exactly in the way that you address it, Ben. As we look at searches now and how we conduct searches, this is a competency that you develop, that it's one in which are you equipped to handle diverse communities? Are you enabled, engaged, and to address issues that come up, whether they're in the classroom or outside of? And the more that we can demonstrate that as a competency and a level of achievement, and you can study that just like you can study government and econ and literature, this is a skill set. Um, and so developing that as a competency that's expected of the workplace we'll get to exactly what you're describing, where it's not such a burden on one person or one office or one individual, but it's an expectancy across the college. Next up, we have Laura Grislano from Arizona. Laura. Hey, all right. Ray, how are you? I'm it's well, how are you? Good, staying, staying healthy so far. Um, first, I just wanted to thank you so much for your leadership and presence and spirit and kindness. It's just been so fantastic having you at our institution and I just count our blessings that we found you. It's really thank you so much been transformational. Um, and I actually was thinking back um, this sort of responsive to Midori's question um, about culture change. And in my work, I do a lot of work with uh, conflict management and teams yeah. that are dysfunctional and communication has broken down. And um, in using the Thomas Kilman and other instruments, I find that increasingly people are very conflict diverse. They're being, you know, I think people, there are a lot of people genetically conflict diverse, but I think our culture and um, training and a lot of, a lot of things are happening to make increasing percentages of people conflict diverse, which seems kind of odd to say in a time of such polarization, but what I find is that people are afraid to engage in tough conversations. And um, in working with some clients, um, I ended up finding incredible value in the Teal Dot program that was created yeah. um, and modified and improved at CMC, 
which is a bystander training program for those who, who don't know the Teal Dot program, especially focused on preventing and addressing sexual violence. And the thing I loved about the curriculum, which I think I maybe even got from you specifically, um, <laughs> but borrowed uh, for work with my client, is that it basically gives people very specific language that they personally can feel comfortable using to step into conversations, you know, where women or or men who are potentially at risk for sexual violence and and um you know based on the idea that we are all our you know our brother and sister's keeper and we all have a role to step in and what i found in completely stealing the teal dot training for work with my clients not around sexual violence issues around completely other issues was that in training them how to use the language it also internalized the point that, that we were trying to kind of get them to engage in. So for example, in this one situation, it was about um, kind of sarcasm and different kinds of communication dysfunction. So in teaching them all the, the ways that you can kind of dive into a conversation to call out somebody's you know, behavior, they all internalize the value of not using that kind of behavior. And I'm wondering if the, you know, the same kind of um, cause I think people want to do the right thing and they want to have the conversations and they want to be anti-racist activists, you know, but it's really hard to know, like specifically, what do I say? How do I jump into a conversation where I'm seeing somebody, you know, use racist behavior or have racist opinions or whatever? How do I, how do I help? What do I actually, what words do I use? And I'm wondering like how much of that, you know, teal dot training can be expanded and required you know of all of our students to sort of give people the language of you know how, how do i do it <laughs> yeah no I, I appreciate that and we've often internally thought like could we do a version of till dot that wasn't based on assault and gender but actually more in race ethnicity religion um how do we step in you know in a variety of those capacities so very much a similar skill set i agree with you I think we've done well in care through care fellows, giving examples of how to intervene and giving the scenarios of where they'll show up. Um, I also do the training for all new hire, new faculty, and we do a lot of that there too. So I think I need to find a way to make it um, more accessible to a bigger group, right? Yeah. Like more of yeah. whether we did it via video or, or how we did it so that a larger group can have that. Cause you're right. Um, we learned a lot from Teal Dot. And what, what was interesting is CMC collects a lot of extraordinary leaders, outgoing people, um, very confident. And the one place that people felt very uncomfortable was trying to correct someone else, exactly. was trying to actually communicate that I dislike something, mm -hmm. um, was where they would just not be able to do it. So it was very easy to intellectually engage on a topic, but very hard to say like, no, I don't wanna go with you. Um, that was like not uh, seen as a polite thing to do. Mm -hmm. And in the community of where we all live together, it was very important to be polite. And so part of our conversation has been um, the reason why we are this way with each other is we're building community. Like we are building community. And what that means is that we have to do things that support the values within the community. So everyone should appreciate if you're corrected because it means I cared for you enough to make sure you are performing and engaged and part of this community and trying to change the narrative of what it means to correct someone. And so I, I appreciate that. And I think that's the direction we'll go in is trying to share it with a broader audience in ways that are very much example based, but you're absolutely right. Those same skills cross over. Awesome. Thanks, Laura. Awesome. Appreciate you. Yeah, you too. We have Doug Peterson next. Doug, go ahead and unmute ask your question. Thank you. Um, first of all, thank you so much for doing this event today. It's been very meaningful and I think it's great to get the CMC community together and also I see a lot of people from the 80s and so I, I'm encouraged to see people from, from my generation joining this dialogue. Um, the business community is very engaged in this dialogue in a completely different way than I've ever seen before uh, myself through the business roundtable in our own company. And what I want to reflect on is that I would really like to see CMC as a leader in this. And I think with you here, and I appreciate everything that Hiram has come, but I know that you're really the power and the force behind this and you have been since ever you joined. But I would really like for CMC to be seen as a leader in this area. 
And so my comment slash question is that I, I do think that we have an opportunity to also do a lot of training and dialogue with the professors, with the faculty. Um, so my question to you is, how are we going to do that? How are we going to make sure the faculty are part of the solution and more engaged? And then also, have you thought of any special research that faculty, uh, faculty could be doing to help advance uh, this dialogue? And thank you again for all you're doing. Oh, thank you so much for that. The, the words are always appreciated and thank you. Um, one, I want to acknowledge, like, I already have a lot of faculty who are doing this work. Um, I had a Zoom just this week with people who wanted to know constructively how they could engage, how they could move forward the initiative. And so you're, you're spot on in the question and the comment is to how do I spread that from the, the pocket I have to the larger across the board um, engagement on this topic. And I think this opportunity will give me that space. Um, part of it is trying to create not just the community who's already invested, but for those who may be less comfortable with this investment, also engaging. And so the way that we plan to go about it is one, um, the initiative only sets out a framework for faculty to actually develop from. And so we will have a pocket of faculty that are a steering committee to make sure it's fully integrated within each department. Part of it too was the part of the initiative that addressed having someone on the search process who's also trained in this. What we're looking for is a certain level of competency in all faculty to engage in these issues, to value these issues. Even if we think there's different rationales for how we got here, um, that part of the Open Academy is still involved even in this initiative. So our, our goal is trying to scale up the amount of information we convey to faculty, but also ways that we incorporate it as part of the way the class is structured. And, and internalizing it in that framework will keep it from being such a one-off side thing that you do, uh, the training that you do online to check the box that it's done. We definitely don't want it to be that. And so I, I plan to utilize, we have many faculty who do a lot of research in this area and to really highlight and center their voices as we integrate this across the curriculum and across departments. We also see the fact that we're planning to do a lot of advances as we explore science and build in science. Um, part of that is integrating a new culture into the campus as we bring in um, more faculty into the space. And so I, I think across the board, as we transition this concept to be not just something that's good if you can, but to something that's a level of expectancy of excellence, we'll get to where you're talking about. But I also appreciate that on the corporate side, if you guys are having the discussion, then that deeply impacts the higher ed side where we're trying to send people to be a part of. Um, so externally, if you guys are doing it, it actually creates space for us to do it so that we can be building capable people to enter your workforce. So the external companies and corporations doing it is critical to our work here as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Camilla. Camilla, go ahead. Oh. Hi, Nairi. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate it. Um, I wanted to kind of echo um, Doug's uh, insight and response. And I kind of wanted to speak to the actionable items that your office is focusing on going forward, right? So we have this broader presidential initiative on anti-racism and the Black experience in America. Um, but I wanted to kind of think of, as we explore that framework, what are areas that you think will be focused on? You kind of touched upon a little bit, but I kind of wanted to hear maybe like increase of representation of uh, professors of color, right? So black professors, research centered around the black experience, and then more broadly, um, you know, across the board of inequality and equity at CMC. Thank you. Thank you. So yes, part of it is some of the discussed, some of the things I discussed earlier, but you're absolutely right. At its core, like we do need to increase the diversity in faculty. And part of that is not only looking at the structure of how we post positions, but it's looking at the entire hiring process. And so part of this is looking at not just for faculty, but for staff, but for even student hires. So I want to give some examples for those who are most familiar. Um, I've had my eye on as an office of trying to make sure that people who come to CMC have the full benefit of the CMC experience. And so I look at a defining part of CMC are research institutes. And so I wanna make sure that if students are doing hiring, that they're actually trained on how to hire and not just duplicate what's comfortable. 
but that you're broadening a scope of let's talk about what's valuable so that all these benefits are accessible to all students. And looking at not just opportunities on can I get more faculty, but making sure that all students, students of color, first gen, international, feel that every aspect, every institute of campus is available, whether it's being an RA. All those things are things that people come to CMC and have defining experiences about. Um, ASCMC is another one. I think people, I don't want anyone precluded because they think they don't have the financial resources to be successful in these spaces. And so that's a big part of looking at the CMC experience as a whole and making sure that it's accessible to all students um, in both curricular and co-curricular ways. I'm looking at the way that we recruit and I actually think admissions does an excellent job at recruitment, like they go all over. And I think we admit a fairly diverse group. I think our concern is who we yield. So we admit a very diverse population, but we don't always get a very diverse population to show up. And so I'm looking at that specific area and to say, you know, part of it is Claremont is very big when you know higher ed. But if you're not really in California, you may not know the Claremont colleges collectively. Like you just may not know that this is an offering. And even if you know, you may not know exactly what it offers. And so there's a tendency if we can't reach out earlier to not be able to share that experience. So I'm really focusing on ways that the minute a student's admitted that we're doing outreach much earlier, outreach to families, making connections, letting them know who our alums are, getting families connected with other families that are already CMC families. I, I think for those who are experiencing, it's much easier if you've already had a, a, you know, a child come here. That's how we get so many brothers and sisters who show up here, two of my kids went here, three of my kids went here. Um, but then you're kind of a, you're a pro parent. Like you know exactly what to do. I have a lot of first gen parents who have no idea how to support their student in this experience. And so getting some mentorship bonds between families, I think will also allow us to increase the yield in ways. So those are some student facing things that I think will build more equity in our system that we're looking at. In terms of just um, faculty recruitment efforts, I think we just need to look at where we're recruiting, how we're recruiting, how do we get people connected to the college before we even put out an ad. So bringing in more people who are either speaking, visiting, um, those who are coming as scholars and residents. Like I just think we need to get more people familiar with the campus so they can see that this is really an opportunity for them. Um, those, are, those are things that we're looking at to get people better connected. I will say from a staff side, it, it is a challenge to get in the Claremont Colleges if you don't already know someone. Like it, it's just a difficult thing. And so part of it is trying to expose opportunities to a broader range of people. Um, so we're not always just going to who's the, the closest or the most connected. So, you know, I hope it answers your question, but those are like the details of what we're looking at to try to build a little more equity into the system across the board for everybody. Thanks, Nuri. Uh, it is 11 a.m. Um, we promised the session would be an hour. Uh, Nuri has agreed to spend a few more minutes with us, so I know we have more questions coming. Uh, I wanted to ask one last thing maybe before some people sign off that could help them um, in, their, in their thoughts moving forward and self-help moving forward, and that is, what books do you recommend? Um, that question came in from Art, and I think everyone would appreciate your thoughts on some reading. Reading materials. Um, so as we're doing that, I'm gonna put my email in the chat for those who have to exit, just so you have it. I will share with you, I'm gonna give a, a few things for you to consider. I saw someone put in the chat, uh, Right Fragility. I think people have had a positive experience with the book. Um, I also think that right now the students, I had three students who came up with like a summer book club and they came up with three narratives, one stamped by the beginning, um, Michelle Alexander's The New Jim Crow, I think that's a good one. I also want to encourage people that you don't have to start with the whole book. So there's a bunch of articles that summarize where we are nicely. And I think if you just even looked at some of the stuff that's come out on Medium, and, and I will post a few as well. Maybe that's a, a good contribution I can have just on the web. Um, that, that really, if you just looked at some of the recent articles that have come out in the area of understanding race, um, those would be helpful too. Because I don't think everybody, even in the summer, have the full time to dedicate to a book. And I respect that. Um, but there's some really good articles out there. Um, one by Kendi, a, a couple of really notable um, authors that are just putting articles out into the Chronicle of Higher Education has had a few. Um, 
yes, thank you, How to Be Anti-Racist. We're reading another book, Stamp from the Beginning by uh, Ibram Kendi, but How, How to Be Anti-Racist is another one. There's a lot of small things that you can read that summarize, summarize a big body of knowledge very quickly. And so I, I encourage you to like Google quickly and dive in, but just know that you don't always have to start with like the biggest book ever, but you can also read a lot of just the discussion that's going on right now in this area of how to be anti-racist um, in different communities that I think would be of value. Just to understand like what the framework is asking and that it doesn't have to be something that's deeply politi politicized in any way, but it really is asking you to look internally and think about it. Yeah, I agree with Ben, uh, 13th on Netflix. Netflix and has been putting a lot of things out um, just in general. So there's, there's also some good movies out if that's your, if that's your pleasure as well. Thanks, Deray. Of course, if you need to depart, feel free to do so. We hope to see you at our future events. Uh, we'll have Governor Steve Bullock with us on Wednesday, July 15th, uh, and alumnus George Russell from the Golf Channel uh, the day before on July 14th. Uh, Naray, um, there were a couple of questions that came through um, about uh, how often we're going to update the alumni population and how the alumni and parents can be involved in this initiative. Anything, any comments there? Sure, we definitely will have um, at an alumni steering committee that's also working on this initiative. So I'll be, I'll be coordinating with Evan a lot, even more than usual, um, but asking for people to get involved. And so if you're interested, feel free to shoot me a note. The other thing in terms of how frequently we'll keep the alums involved, usually I'll try to make it part of the publications that generally come out with the college. So it, in some ways, maybe I'll start just a little article that gives an update. Um, if the alums would like something quarterly, I'd be open to it. And I think that's part of the feedback that I would get from the alumni committee is like, what is the best way to communicate uh, with this group? But we definitely want, are looking to do something way more than annually, um, but, but probably at least a, a quarterly publication of, you know, something that will generate this is where we are. Our first update will be in September. Um, so. Uh, the first week of September, you'll expect something. It'll, it'll definitely be a community message that will likely be forwarded to alumni and parents as well. But um, September will be our next update. Thank you. Uh, Dakota, you had a question earlier. You had your hand raised. Uh, did you want to ask a question? Or I know you don't have a raise anymore. Go ahead and unmute. Dakota, Dakota left. I'm her mom. This is Karen Anderson. Um, you know, I think you answered part of our question. My question was, and, and her question too, was just about access. You know, I feel like CMC, she's, we're so happy she's going to CMC. We're very excited. Um, but, you know, when she was in the process of applying to different colleges, I noticed that the 4% that was talked about was kind of like standard. It was a standard across different colleges and that she applied to and maybe it was because she went through Crestbridge I'm not really exactly sure but you know I just I was very heartened to hear um Naira talk about how um it's about people coming you know that that CMC is doing a good job of of getting out there and finding people that would benefit from your awesome education so you know that was what our question was about was about access Great. Right. I, I hope part of what I shared earlier helped in that regard, um, but it's constantly a focus of where we're trying to go, that, that we want people not just, to, not just to show up, but to actually thrive while here. And part of the, that ability is to get to them early enough to know what this place has to offer. And I think it's such an exceptional experience um, that, that we want to be able to share that with the largest group possible. Um, QuestBridge is an amazing program, by the way, and, and I value our partnership tremendously. Um, but it allows us at least an opportunity to connect with families earlier, even than the application cycle. And so that's where I really want to focus energies and really focus on getting families connected. I, I don't know if everyone understands, um, especially from a first gen perspective, like the importance of, of what that community means and to have a whole family come to this space. That's unusual. Like, you know, there's a, there's a lot of other big places where it's not so much of a family experience. And I think CMC is very much a family experience. And so I, I need people to know that that's part of this process, that, that we want your entire family to be engaged with us. Thank you for that question. Let, let Dakota know. Thanks. All right, Rebecca, go ahead. Hi, Naree. Hey. 
How are you? I hope you're you're doing well. Um, I am, I've thanks. seen you know throughout this conversation, it's it's really great that people are very committed to their alma mater. Um, it makes my job as a staff person um, even better when I see a very committed community. Um, right. And I think I want to talk about a little bit of self reflection and about making mistakes. And um, <laughs> I think at this time, one of the things that I've been really scared is about not saying the wrong thing or um, you know, offending someone. Can you talk a little bit about how, well, I mean, is that okay? I mean, I know we're all going to make mistakes. I guess I'm just, just want to talk about like self-reflection a little bit. <laughs> no, I appreciate it's that. It's really hard. <laughs> it is hard. No, it, it's, it's not easy work. work. What I've asked hard. for you is not easy. Mm -hmm. um, but, but here's the other side that I'm really working on. As much as I teach self-reflection, I also teach grace. And I'm trying to educate people to give each other more grace. If I'm expecting so many people to learn so many different things and to put them in spaces where they are truly uncomfortable, I have to be in a space to provide grace when it doesn't go as well as they had hoped. And so as we build tools for how to address and how to correct, um, you know, and, and, and part of it is people are like, I want to call it out. And I'm like, I want you to call them in. I want you to actually work on calling people in because um, the benefit is to acknowledge that mistakes will happen. And, and for those of us who have done this work a long time, mistakes still happen. But I think people need to demonstrate their intention and people will provide you grace. And, and I know how scary it is now. I think doing this work at a time before social media is a lot easier than doing this work now because now your mistakes are amplified so quickly um, and people are so scared of having that experience. But what I want people to understand is that when we come into the space of a common goal, and at least you have enough trust to know that the person is not trying to harm, um, then we can have these reflective moments. I think if there's people who are feeling like I'm nervous and scared, then my goal is to build more trust within our own community to minimize that. And so that's what's really important is that in order for any of this to work, we have to have a community with some level of trust. And for us, it's really starting with as we bring people in. As I do new orientation for faculty, as I do it for students, we really try to think about, um, let's understand what happens when we mess up and how to do that correctly. And I do a lot of work in teaching people how to say I'm sorry um, in a way that's acceptable because quite frankly, for the most part, people are like, well, I'm sorry if you're offended which means you've offended me again, right? Because you're making it conditional on like, if I did it, if I'm, if I'm fragile in some way, if I'm the one who's embraced this in the wrong way than you intended. And so part of this is we educate people on their intention versus their impact and how the impact can be the exact same, even though your intention was different. Um, but we also educate people on the fact of how to apologize and just own an error. And to say the best I can do is commit to being different and not making the same mistake again. And, and people are usually very open to that. People are very open to the fact of if you own it and acknowledge that I'm working on it, um, people do tend to give you grace. But, but I definitely think it's part of the education and the way that we do this work. So that's an excellent question. I appreciate it. Thank you, Nere, and thank you, everyone. That is all the time we have. Uh, Nere, hopefully you'll consider joining us again uh, in the near future, especially as we go through some of our um, conversations and meetings sure. and start to formulate more of our plans moving forward. Um, yeah, thank you for having me. This has been special. I appreciate it. Great. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate you and all the work that you do. Everyone have a wonderful rest of your day. Have a wonderful 4th of July weekend, uh, and we hope to see you uh, on future programming. So, good day, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye, you guys. guys. Thanks so much. Thank you. Great to see you, Ben. Thanks, everybody. Bye, Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>